Good morning. I'm State Representative Jonathan Steinberg from uh, Jonathan Steinberg from the 136th District, West, representing Westport, co-chair of the Public Health Committee. We're here today to JF bills. We have a number of bills on the agenda. We want to get started right away. I will turn to my co-chair, the esteemed Senator Anwar. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, and let the meeting begin, uh, Representative. Thank you, Senator. Rock and roll. Good morning, Representative Pettit. Good morning, Mr. Chair. We're ready to go. I love the attitude of this committee. Um, I do not see our rankings at this moment, but I'm sure they'll be joining us shortly. Just so you know, this is a busy day for the whole legislature, and uh, we're going to be getting started straight away. And we're going to keep everybody on their toes. We're not going to go in the precise order of the agenda as, uh, as published. We're going to start with the second bill, Senate Bill 371, an act allowing infection pre prevention and control specialists to provide services to adjacently located and commonly owned or operated facilities. This is a JFS. Is there a motion? So move. So move. Recognize Representative Pettit. Do I have a second? Second, second. Senator Anwar. I'm, uh, next time, Senator. Okay. Um, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with this bill, it is the direct result of uh, many of the things we observed during the earliest days of the pandemic when uh, our uh, nursing homes were the hardest hit and uh, there were serious concerns about whether there were uh, uniform and sufficient infection control in going on there. We've learned a lot, we've changed our protocols, but this bill uh, goes a little bit further. It, uh, it limits the current requirement that these facilities uh, uh, employ a full-time specialist to only those with more than 60, and then they can have a part-time less than 60. This is not a weakening. Many of our nursing homes were out of compliance previously, and by requiring them to have at least a part-time specialist and improving the protocols through DPH, we are actually strengthening the requirements that are there. Secondly, it requires the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to, uh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong, uh, wrong thing. It has nothing to do with them. Allows the infection prevention and control specialists to provide services at both types of facilities or, or two nursing homes that are not, that are next to each other or on the same campus or are commonly owned and operated, meaning that will create the network for uh, part-time specialists and allows DPH to waive lo the laws, infection prevention and control specialist requirements if the commissioner determines that doing so would not endanger the facilities, residents, or employees. And there's also a section for elderly housing complexes funded through HUD's assisted living conversion program. Are there, uh, do, uh, do I uh, have any comments or questions? Yes, Representative Pettit. Uh, Mr. Chair, this uh, is ready to move forward. Can we put this on a consent calendar, sir? Uh, we have, we, first we would need to create a consent calendar. Does anybody object to that? If not, we can take on Representative Pettit's kind suggestion to put item number two in the consent calendar. Are there any concerns, objections? Seeing none, we will add it to the consent calendar. Thank you, Representative Pettit. Moving along, we're gonna take on item four of the agenda. Four in your, in your, on your score sheet. Um, item four is Senate Bill 454, an act concerning the Department of Public Health's recommendations regarding the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This bill requires DPH to provide guidelines to school boards on administering the survey and, and the boards in turn to administer the survey to the selected schools following DPH guidelines. Among other things, the guidelines must address the CDC survey protocol, method for parents to opt their children out of the survey they so choose, and requirements to the survey to be anonymous and designed to protect student privacy. Let me emphasize that. There will be no identifiers, no disaggregated data. This is to, to achieve the, uh, the CDC's, the federal government's objectives to, uh, to do these youth surveys in the high schools. So uh, this is a uh, JF to the floor. Do I have a motion? 
Senator Onwar. Senator Onwar moves. Has, has moved. Thank you. Seconded by Representative Gilchrist. Are there comments or questions with regard to this bill? Representative Pettit. Uh, just that the uh, Representative uh, Dauphine is in, in transit has indicated that she would prefer that the bill have a uh, uh, opt in as opposed to opt out provision. It will be voting against this, so it would not be able to go on the consent calendar, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we will note that we, ha we have had discussions in the past for, about opt in and opt out. Obviously, an opt out will assure a uh, collection of more data, but we certainly sympathize with the, uh, the interest in uh, offering clear options to. to hey, can I get a medium hot tea with two sweet lows and a medium iced tea with two sweet lows, please? Sorry, not my table. Uh, okay, get, getting back to matters at hand. Uh, the two things we want to emphasize that this is uh, not going to be in any way disaggregated data, no personal identifiers, and our, every family has the right to opt out if they so choose. Those are the key elements. This is, again, the CDC survey. This is not our survey, but we want to implement it appropriately. Seeing that there is at least one objection to, uh, to unanimous, we will do a roll call vote, Madam Administrator, whenever you're ready. Representative Steinberg. Representative Steinberg votes yes. Senator Anwar. Senator Anwar votes yes. Senator Kushner. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Wong. Senator Summers. Representative Pettit. Representative Pettit votes yes. Representative Arnone. Representative Arnone votes yes. Representative Berger Givalo. Representative Betts. Representative Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Representative Cook. Representative Cook votes yes from a parked car. Representative Dauphine. <laughs> Representative D'Amico. Representative D'Amico votes yes. Representative Elliott. Representative Foster. Rep Foster votes yes. Representative Django. Representative Django votes yes. Representative Green. Representative Green votes yes. Senator Haskell. Representative Cabras de Gras. Cabras de Gras votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Kennedy votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Kennedy votes yes. Thank you. Representative Claritas Dietria. Representative Claritas Dietria votes yes. Representative Lenahan. Representative McCarthy. Senator Moore. Representative Ryan. Representative Scanlon. Representative Tersiak. Representative Tersiak votes yes. Thank you. Representative Young. Representative Young votes yes. Representative Zupkis. Representative Zupkis votes yes, but I would like the opt in versus opt out. Senator Kushner, Senator Wong, 
Senator Summers, Representative Berger Givalo, Representative Betts. Representative Betts votes yes. Representative Dauphiné. Representative Elliott. Senator Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Representative Linehan. Representative Linehan votes yes. Representative McCarthy. Senator Moore. Representative Parker. Representative Parker votes yes. Representative Ryan. Representative Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we are gonna be keeping the votes open uh, to 11 a.m. this morning. So for those who are just arriving, there's still opportunities to vote. We will next move to item five on the agenda, Senate Bill 456, an act concerning clean and safe well water. This is a JFS. Do I have a motion? So move. So move. Second. Pressed, seconded by? Second. Representative Foster. Okay. Uh, by law, the deep commissioner determines that groundwater pollution has or is reasonably expected to occur, and the DPH commissioner determines that pollutions create or are reasonably expected to create an unacceptable risk to people using their well water for drinking and other domestic use, the commissioner may order the person or municipality responsible for that pollution to provide potable drinking water to all people affected by it. Now, this is basically something we've talked about for a couple of years where we know there are some contaminated wells and the importance of getting people potable water in a timely fashion. Um, we have the agreement of uh, both DEEP and, and DPH on this. We may still noodle the words a little bit, but uh, it's ready to go. Do we have any comments or questions? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my fellow committee members for um, supporting this really important bill. Um, in the towns of Ellington and East Windsor, we have hundreds of homes that are impacted by contaminations that cause toxicity in the water. I shared during the public hearing, um, even a family who was making baby formula with road salt contaminated um, water and was unaware until they installed a home brewing situation uh, system and tested their water quality. I am hearing um, the complaints from the Realtors Association and their concerns about this. And I'm willing as someone who's a strong proponent of this bill for the protection of public health to see if there's a better time to support um, encouraged testing. But I am, oh, that happens. I believe never mind is your-, your Never mind. The people of Ellington and East Windsor still have contaminated right. well waters of a concern, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to see this. Thank you, day. Representative. It, it's unusual that we actually have two well bills in the same session, so it's easy to be confused. But this bill is only dealing with the potable water. Are there other comments or questions? Representative Pettit. Mr. Chair, I, if there's no objection, I'd like to place this on the consent calendar. Thank you, Representative Pettit. Are there any objections to putting this bill on the consent calendar? Seeing none, we will add it to the consent calendar. We will next move on to item one of today's agenda. Okay. Senate Bill 367, an act concerning electronic nicotine delivery systems and vapor products. This is a JF. Do I have a motion? So move. So move. Gilcrest, seconded by Senator Anwar, second. Senator Anwar, second. Okay. Where do I begin with this one? We, uh, in Connecticut, uh, passed incredibly important legislation several years ago, which we now call the Tobacco 21 Bill, which was our first effort to stem the uh, epidemic of vaping among young people. It was very important legislation. Interestingly, States surrounding us have followed our lead and in fact have gone a step further than we have. At that juncture, we chose not to deal with the very thorny issue of vaping flavors. 
but vowed that we would keep track of what was going on with the FDA, which is reviewing the entire category, in fact, the entire industry, and see if we wanted to come back in a period of time to address the issue of the flavors. And he, because the FDA is uh, being extremely deliberate in its efforts, and it's not exactly clear when and how they will rule, that we feel it's important, particularly since the states around us are already there, for us to tackle the issue of vaping flavors we chose not to tackle some years ago. This bill intends to do that. It prohibits e-cigarette dealers from selling, delivering, giving, or possessing with the intent to sell e-cigarettes and vapor products with a nicotine content greater than 35 milligrams per milliliter or a flavoring agent other than tobacco. In other words, only tobacco is allowed and no other flavors. It requires e-cigarette manufacturers to provide documentation to e-cigarette dealers on the nicotine content so the dealers know what they have. It requires DEMAS to conduct unannounced compliance checks on e-cigarette dealers as they often do to check compliance. Uh, and the DRS commissioner may impose civil penalties for violators. Increases the penalties for sales of cigarettes, tobacco products, e-cigarettes, and vapor products for individuals under age 21 and extends the same increased penalties to e-cigarette dealers who violate the ban, the flavor ban and nicotine content requirements. And lastly, increases the penalties on owners of establishments with cigarette vending machines and restricted cigarette vending machines to sales to individuals under the legal age. So to be clear, we are directly addressing the issue of flavors. We are increasing penalties for those who do not behave well. Uh, do I have uh, any, we'll start with Representative Foster. I want to thank my colleagues for taking some time to talk to me about this and indulging my mistake earlier. I apologize. Um, so I, I have had a lot of feelings about this bill's discussion as it's gone forward. And we have heard from a lot of folks about the science, but as currently written, I'm advocating for changes to SB 367. And I wish I could vote this bill out of committee and support the proponents in aligning this bill with the state of the science, but I feel the need to flag this bill for opportunities for improvement. To be clear, I support limiting access of all tobacco products to youth, and I support the portions of this bill that strengthen penalties for those who sell to minors. As a counter policy, I wholeheartedly advocate for advocacy uh, limiting sales of all tobacco products, including vapes and combustibles, to 21 plus venues. This policy would offer more protection because limiting venues to those who sell only to minors would decrease youth access while allowing access to adults who need it as a cessation aid. We should increase penalties, perhaps even more than what's in this bill, to vendors who sell to minors. I support a three strike policy to taking away license for those who sell to minors, which is stronger than what's outlined here. And children should not go shopping in a convenience store or a gas station with their parents and see tobacco products wrapped in candy-like packaging. I support all of these concepts in the bill. But there is a well-done synthesis in the American Journal of Public Health written by the 15 past presidents of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco and I leaned heavily on this report in aligning my philosophy on how I'd vote for this policy. There's a detailed testimony by Dr. Abigail Friedman, a Yale School of Public Health research scientist. You can comprehensively dissect the likely outcomes of a policy like this on combustible tobacco use, and it is not protecting the best public health interest. Vaping is likely substantially less dangerous than smoking combustibles. There, is less, there are less chemicals by two orders of magnitude. There are lower biomarkers of toxic exposure. And when our parents who are smokers, who have children in their house, switch from combustible cigarettes to e-cigarettes, their lung function improves. If you care about children, you care about their parents too. While the e-cigarettes are not perfect, I do not support anyone starting e-cigarettes or vaping. There are unintended consequences to banding, banning e-cigarettes without restricting access to flavored combustibles or combustibles of any kind. I am concerned that adults will, supported by the science, likely switch 
from e-cigarettes to combustible forms, which is more dangerous for their children and themselves. And I am worried that folks who were, uh, uh, that children might switch from their addiction of e-cigarettes to combustibles. There is a plethora of data to support that adults will switch. And there is some emerging science that supports that children might when these policies are enacted. In one particularly persuasive study, perhaps not the one that we like to malign um, in a lot of this testimony, when a Minnesota e-cigarette tobacco tax was implemented, adults reduced cessation and switched to e-cigarettes or and switched to combustible. And the estimates on this study suggest that 2.75 million smokers would be persuaded against cessation if a policy like this were enacted. Although it would be easier and significantly more comfortable to me to align with the advocates who want children to not have access to tobacco, it would be easier if we could just say e-cigarettes were evil and ban them. I wish we could. I wish the science supported that, but it doesn't. The best way to prevent children from consuming tobacco is to limit their access. I wish we could do that in this bill. I wish we could move all tobacco sales to 21 plus venues. That would make a significant difference. E-cigarette use in children is declining. I don't want kids to smoke e-cigarettes but this is not the policy solution that offers the best protection to kids. We cannot forsake their parents who are addicted for a policy that we want to work. I am worried that it will not. Today, to protect parents and adults battling addiction, I am committed to working with proponents of this bill to make it better and aligned with science. But today I'm voting no, because this is not in the best interest of kids. Thank you, Representative Foster. Uh, I want to commend you on your uh, measured uh, analysis. You have clearly done your homework. I think this committee has been the recipient of enough data to choke a horse. We've seen enough meta-analyses uh, for any one session or more. Uh, it's a real challenge for us. We're not statisticians. We're not experts in statistical significance and reliability or in methodologies and the like. And we've heard uh, data presented on both sides, which sounds quite compelling. And I know it's a challenge for all of us to determine all things considered with all that we've been presented, what's the best answer on balance to protect people here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I'm convinced this is going to uh, interdict at the, at the beginning for a lot of young people who might be attracted to the prospect of the coolness of e-cigarettes and may therefore now uh, not uh, go down that pathway to addiction. And uh, we are all hopeful that, that this decision will have the intended effect and, and not other consequences. Representative Pettit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, well summarized, and uh, I also uh, applaud my colleague, Representative Foster, for a nice uh, synthesis. So I, I will be brief. I thought for the hours of testimony that we heard that the most convincing testimony was from Dr. Friedman from Yale. And to summarize, I think, three pages of type testimony, I think two major concerns that bans might increase the, the uh, children's use of combustible products and second, these policies may reduce adult uh, cessation <laughs> efforts. Uh, she really had a, a balanced presentation backed up by science and, and information and uh, reviewed journals. So I, though I agree with the concept to prevent children and, every, and as many people as possible from vaping and, vaping and obviously smoking combustibles, I think this bill needs a little bit, little bit more work to achieve its uh, desired goal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. We remain open to further conversations. We've had a lot of conversations, but we remain open to further ones. Next up is Representative Clara Dietria, followed by Representative Carpino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I echo what both my uh, colleagues said, Representative Foster and Representative Pettit. One question I had, does this law, does this bill, if passed, apply to online sales? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative. It does not address online sales, which is something we have discussed as well in the past, and is a cer certainly a problem area. Uh, I would be open to seeing what we can do and seeing what other states have done on that score, but this bill does not specifically go after that as far as I'm aware. Thank you. And, and we've heard that 
kids, children now will just go to the online sales as they do now. I think one of the, one of the really important issue, issues that we have a problem with is enforcement. So we need our business owners to card our children and, and underage. And the same thing with package stores and liquor stores. If we had more enforcement, this would probably cut down on part of our problem. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellent point, Representative, which is one reason why we've chosen to strengthen the penalties in order to give them plenty of incentive to do that kind of checking. Representative Carpino. Thank you, sir. I agree with all of my colleagues before, and I too wish that I could support this because I, I don't know anybody who would want to see more children come to harm due to tobacco. But, but I, I am disappointed that this is here in the form that it is. We spent a very long day listening to a wide number of folks with very important testimony. And it is disappointing, at least to me, to see JF language and not JFS language. We have another week. This is not a new concept to us. And we listened to some very, very bright individuals who all offered their assistance if we needed their help in making changes. So I agree with the penalties. I agree with the intent, but I cannot support this bill in this form. I do hope that if we see it again, it is going to accomplish what we'd like in more nuanced language. Um, but sadly enough, as much as I supported the Tobacco 21 bill. I, I can't support the bill in the form that it is here today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative. As I said, we always remain open to further conversation. Any number of our bills will go through some changes after the fact, and we'd love to have the conversation with regard to the more nuanced language as you described. Though I think I would be misrepresenting the chair's in intentions to suggest other than our intent to follow through with this bill in its uh, present direction. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, Madam Administrator, I believe we're ready for a roll call vote. Representative, I'm sorry, did I miss Representative McCarty? The ham must have gone up at the end. Okay, take your time. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I too am having, I've been struggling a lot with this uh, proposal. I was disappointed not to see some JFS language in it. So um, it's a tough decision for all of us. Um, I naturally don't want to see our students and our children vaping more. I know it's an issue in the schools. So, and I was a yes last uh, session, but there was some compelling evidence that I had not thought about uh, this session. So I too hope that as we continue to look at this, that we can make some of the improvements. So today I will be a no with the hope that we can get the bill in good order uh, if it reaches the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative McCarty. Uh, we appreciate the fact, I think all of us for at least a period of time wrestled with what's the best thing to do. Um, we believe this is a good bill to get out of committee and we're open to conversations, but as I stated, it's our intent to ban vaping flavors. Any other comments or questions? Madam Administrator, now we're ready for a roll call vote. Representative Steinberg. Representative Steinberg votes yes. Senator Anwar. Senator Anwar votes yes. Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner votes yes. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Wong. Senator Summers. Senator Summers votes no. Representative Pettit. Representative Pettit votes no. Representative Arnone. Representative Arnone votes yes. Representative Berger Givalo. Representative Betts. Representative Betts votes no. Representative Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Representative Cook. Representative Cook votes yes. Representative Dauphiné. Representative D'Amico. Representative D'Amico votes yes. Representative Elliott. 
Representative Foster. Rep Foster votes no. Representative Jenga. Representative Jenga votes yes. Senator Haskell. <clears throat> Representative Cabras de Gros. Representative Kennedy. Kennedy votes no. Representative Claritis Dietrio. Representative Claritis Dietrio votes no. Representative Linehan. Representative Linehan votes yes. Representative McCarthy. Representative McCarty votes no. Senator Moore. Representative Parker. Representative Parker votes yes. Representative Ryan. Representative Scanlon. Representative Tersiak. Representative Tersiak votes yes. Representative Young. Representative Young votes yes. Representative Zupkis. Representative Zupkis votes no. Senator Wong. Representative Berga Gibalo. Representative Dauphiné. Representative Elliott. Representative Green. Representative Green votes no. Senator Haskell. Representative Cavers de Gros. Senator Moore, Representative Ryan, Representative Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lenahan. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, in the beginning of the meeting, uh, I missed the call to put 371 uh, onto the consent calendar. I do have an objection to that going on the consent calendar. Do I need to make a motion to remove it? I do not know what the rules are. Now, that once we've already established the consent calendar put on it, I will, uh, we will be temporarily in recess until our uh, lawyers can uh, rule on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll bring the committee back into order. The uh, opinion from our lawyers suggests that we can simply remove that bill from the consent calendar. Uh, we will have to uh, do a roll call vote on it at the end since we've already uh, considered the bill. Um, I think we will move on to item six on the agenda.
Item six is Senate Bill 457, an act concerning the Department of Public Health's recommendations regarding Connecticut's immunization information system. This is a JF, do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Representative Gilchrist. Do I have a second? Second by Terziak. Second by Representative Terziak. Thank you. Uh, this bill makes a number of changes to the state's immunization information system, what we know as CTWIZ. Not all of us love CTWIZ, but we all know it. Uh, primarily to expand the program to include immunization information for all residents instead, instead of only children. I would say we've learned anything in the pandemic is we need good immunization information uh, to, for uh, everyone's benefit. Um, it will do a few other things as well. Uh, it requires providers to report immunizations they administer to patients of all ages instead of just six and younger. Requires providers to provide the vaccine recipient, his or her legal guardian or conservator or parent or guardian, if a minor, information on how to opt out of CTWIS. Once again, there is an opt out. Uh, it additionally uh, allows providers to use CTWIS to assess or officially document a patient's immunization status, that's for providers. It requires DPH to provide local health directors with immunization information on their residents in order to address unvaccinated communities and improve health equity. And by which we mean information, we mean aggregated, non-specific identified information. It allows DPH to exchange CTWIS information with state and federal energies, again, in an aggregated form and allows residents to access their immunization records in CTWIS upon request and requires providers participating in, in Connecticut's vaccine program for children to place all vaccine orders through CTWIS so that we can uh, make sure that we are uh, adequately allocating the uh, available vaccines to take care of as many people as possible. And with that, I will open it up to Questions or comments? That's a quiet bunch up I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Uh, you'll find it. Our uh, representative Zepkis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't find how to, I don't have my glasses on how to raise my hand. Um, this bill, again, to me, is one of these things the whole that you, you have, I am of the school that you need to opt into this. Anytime I've had to get any immunity uh, questions for my kids' schools, the school nurses, my doctor gives it over um, immediately. I've never had a problem with that. Um, this information, uh, as you just stated, is going to be handed over to local uh, health districts, correct? Is that correct? That is correct in, in its aggregated form. So, um, Will those health districts have, you say aggregated, but if my child is not in it, are they going to see Reagan Zupkis is not, hasn't been vaccinated for certain things and they will uh, have that information number one and then go to the schools to quote unquote educate to try to get these kids uh, vaccinated? Thank you for the question. Let me be absolutely clear. No personal information will be shared with the health districts. And I know of no specific policy to pressure or educate, as you describe, anyone on the need to be vaccinated, though there are a number of other educational efforts that are part of the state's effort to get as many people vaccinated as possible. That is not the intent of this legislation. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes, Madam. 